Hi, oh my goodness, I'm running late this morning, but good morning. How are you? I'm searching for, I'm gonna add in my mama here, my very patient. It's funny that the first person who's joined us, that they're oh. handled, sorry I'm late. I think that's Callie. It is, it's Callie. So the reason I'm late is because I had a lipstick mishap on my face but here we are we're doing the thing anyway hi jen well hi jen. i hope you're feeling well i'm yes. trying to figure out how to set up my ipad here i have so many facts today and i need my hey iPad. Teresa. okay well you know what's really really funny like we're gonna we're gonna be talking this is uh some hormone replacement. Oh, hey. And the reason I have it is because I have to go pick up some more. I'm, I'm out. That's the story in itself. Ladies, hey, Karis. Hey, girl. Um, so, I, thanks. We got our glasses at the eye bar in Sherwood Park. Both of us. And remember when, I, I, were these the ones that I said, oh, I don't know. I don't know about these ones. For, For you. mine? Yeah. Yeah, you did not want me to get these glasses. And I have to say, you were wrong. I fine. was totally. Did we not you get both of them? And, but that's fine because they're not everybody's cup of tea. But I can't. No, no, I, tell I, I love them. But it was like, oh, I thought we were only going to get one. And then we ended up, well, I said, let's just get both. Oh, um, okay. But these glasses, I've gotten the most compliments on in my entire life. Because I've, let me tell you, I've had some glasses that did not warrant compliments they they warranted concern well i i let you pick your own out yeah and i think that that is i'm trying to adjust my lighting i don't think anybody's gonna be able to help me with my makeup today it was a real quick job um those lips are anyways. amazing and your We're earrings here. yes these earrings today i am wearing from another local small business um, and I will definitely tag her in um, our show notes or whatever you want to call them. Um, yeah. Her her company is called Hello Ashto, and she hand makes all of these, um, all of them, and they're beautiful, and I oh, love thanks, them. Jen. Um, we love our funky earrings. We do. Mm. And just a shout out. I'm not. I'm not actually wearing a pair. I I went kind of like I don't know. I know it's like the one time. That she comes on our live. <laughs> Sorry, Karis, I don't have my earrings on. But you know what? I feel like I should run and go get them because there's I have the most beautiful Wait, earrings by Karis. But oh no, I, it's fine. What's that? <sighs> rocky, rocky start this morning. Okay, no, you know what? I I wanted to actually kind of recap a little bit about. Um, <laughs> I want to recap a little bit about last uh, last week because we talked about the crone photo shoot that I did. Yeah. And, you know, funnily enough, right after we finished this, she posted a few pictures. Yes. And I have to say that, you know, and, I, and I, I mean this with my whole heart, that the experience was worth everything. I really, the pictures were secondary, but almost the, the honest truth in the back of my mind was she was never going to get, <laughs> she's a very talented photographer, but she would never be able to get a good picture of me. <laughs> and then I saw these pictures. And I hope I you're bringing this back around. I literally like welled up. I just went and they look like me. That's so yeah. anyway, I just wanted to touch on that because we get insecure about what we look like and how we're perceived and you know people can do I, I just she's a so she's such a gifted photographer and she doesn't change you she listens to you and she helps you tell your story through photography and it, it really it was the most beautiful experience and Ruth the makeup artist was like so much fun and I talked about that but I just wanted to share that the the pictures were icing on the cake of the whole thing well and don't you think that it's kind of like i think maybe why the photos elicit such a emotional and like amazing 
reaction when you saw them is because it's like, I think maybe for the first time or in a long time, you see yourself as other people see you as you see yourself as like how you how you really look and then you think like wow like she saw me she saw me like i was yeah. actually seen in in that experience and that was captured and there wow. cuz i i've had we're going deep right in, in off the hop um we're not I've even had on the experiences topic. what i think go ahead I've had experiences where, you know, I've gotten photos back and I'm like, who is that person? <laughs> That's not I, me. That doesn't look like me. Why did, why did she edit me so much? Or why, why did this happen? Um, and you just kind of feel like you weren't seen. And that's I, like I remember I remember that photography session that he had and I mean everyone has their style. And yeah. I remember looking telling you, I said, Raina, you need to to send these back and say, I want you to like, like, let me, let me look like me. Like, this doesn't look like me at all. And yeah. you remember how hard it was for her to do that for you. Yeah. And it didn't end up happening. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't, it wasn't an option. And you know what? Like, again, everybody has their own styles and there's definitely markets for different things that people want in their photos, but some people want the texture on their skin, want, you know, yeah. um, you know, the things that they've accumulated from the gift of time. Exactly. Look at that. So deep. So anyway, I just really wanted to touch on that. And um, also, I just have to uh, say that Teresa is an amazing photographer. Um, you should check out her page. Uh, she just does so much. And she's about, she also is about empowering women and really in there with entrepreneurs and just shining a light on them like I I love the pictures that she's doing and I mean she's not just one dimensional she does like so many different types of uh, photography and I love to see women blossom in uh, what their passion is and you know over time because we don't stay the same uh, we evolve in that passion so I just it's beautiful and Teresa is a wonderful photographer um, so Let's start our beautiful music. Oh, and yeah, then wow. you can do the intro. The in. intro. The awkward dance. I think you can talk through it. Are we loud? We make our own rules. Oh. We're talking through it. You totally can talk through it. We 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 quietly. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> so welcome to episode 10. <laughs> is it um, nine? We don't know what episode this is, but welcome to it. And I'm Raina. That's Kathy. We're a mother daughter duo who are just sharing a candid look inside our everyday conversations and things that we're passionate about. And hopefully you can stick with us through all, all the twists and turns because we have no sense of direction and we really like to go off on ten, tiny tangents. <laughs> well, that's the truth. Well, and you know, it's interesting because um, we don't script these. Uh, and it really is, you, you guys are invited to a conversation with Raina and I. And we do talk about, sometimes we talk about really deep subjects. Uh, usually in there, there will be humor. Uh, sometimes there's tears. Uh, you, you actually never know what you're gonna get. And for sure, there can be tiny tangents or there can be very large tangents. Um, and there can be straight runaways. Uh, so um, I forgot to set my watch because I wanted to make sure that we didn't go over time. And we started so late. Because we... Yeah, so don't worry, I'm, I'm adding a timer because I, I don't want us to end abruptly like we did last time. Nobody wants that. Yeah, um, and I'm not going to apologize. I'm just going to no. say thank you for waiting for me. Well, that's real life, isn't it? It totally is. So today, today we're, today we're going to talk about women's health and specifically, I think, women's... Oh, right. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, you're wearing LOS the West. I am wearing the Rebel Broad crew. 
Oh old school. God. Yeah, I love, we love, actually, it's not LOS the West. It is the Rebel Broad crew. Right, and, it's changed, right? Yeah. yeah, and I remember, I remember, she's really, she's, she's hit her niche. Um, I, I remember getting this Rebel Broad crew t-shirt with a skull on it, because I love skulls. And I just love the word broad. It's kind of like I love the word crone. I'm not offended by any kind of statements. Uh, well, the reclaiming certain, of these words. Yeah, certain things. But um, anyway, uh, I love her. And I love what she stands for. She is so honest. She is so open. And she, she straight shoots, like, right between the lookers. Um, but she does what she wants when she wants so it's like if you are a fan of hers and you want something you just watch because she's not out there all the time um and it is worth the wait but anyway we're going to be talking about i actually when did a little i printed this up yes and this is a very decorative ornate uterus actually beautiful shirt. beautiful i know right and yeah the female reproductive system really i think is kind of where we're landing today well, um, and so, okay, so not it's, really. it's a broad topic, and yeah. we talked about this, like, over text a little bit before in that, you know, we want to make sure we cover all our bases and and are inclusive in everything that we're talking about and making sure we're giving accurate information, and yes. you can't cover everything in one episode, yeah. definitely not something of this magnitude, and so we're going to be kind of going through you know, our own experiences and information that we have come up with and we're continuing to research. So we're going to be doing more episodes on stuff like this. But basically, we're going to be talking about women in medical care in Canada specifically. Yes. Because that's where we live. Um, and the, you know, the different issues within that realm, be it inequality, um, accessibility, um, not being included in research, um, N inadequate care and um and some of the good things about it too so we're <laughs> yeah there's right? some good things there are positives but but you know what the the system is really can be really really problematic for women and um there's actually a lot of uh information out there now about why it is that way and what needs to change and we're nowhere near where we need to be with it. Um, and we just feel like it's really important to talk about that. And, and one of the reasons like we, we've talked about, we, we talked about endometriosis uh, in March, which was for you, you again, like, oh, I don't know if I should do this. And it's like, no, we need to talk about it. It's, it's the silence that is um, defeating. Uh, we need to speak. And I know that not always, we're not always heard. But we, we can't be quiet because not everybody's listening. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I should write that down. We can't well, be quiet because not everybody's listening. Well, and the thing that, that brings up a very important little statistic I want to throw out there right off the hop is, you know, from with, within the research rabbit hole of, of all the things I've had to do for my endometriosis, um, it has been found that in, issues pertaining to women's health, especially chronic illness and chronic pain, 75% um, of women are dismissed as neurotic when it comes to oh. talking about bringing up, um, trying to find answers to get to the root of the issues that they're dealing with medically in their own bodies. And a big part of what we want to talk about and and why it is that way is because we're not women are not included in research yeah um yeah and, so and it so you're like kind of you've got the stats don't you you have a lot more, well, more I mean, information I have some. I have yeah some. you have some stats i kind of looked at like i I dug into what a hysterectomy is, the different types, why it's done, the after, like, like what happens after, what are the risks. I, I looked up that because it was relevant um, to, well, actually what's happening with you and I myself had a hysterectomy, which I didn't even actually understand the type of hysterectomy I had. 
which yeah. I guess, do you want me to start with that or should we? Well, yes, I definitely do. And I think that the, it's important because one of the reasons we, like you said, we are talking about this is, you know, on April 30th, I'm going in um, to a special um, center in Calgary, um, the South Health Campus, where it's, you know, the only place where I can access remotely close to where I live that has uh, somebody who who's a minimally invasive gynecological surgeon, um, which is very important. Yes. Um, but I'm going there for excision surgery um, for my endometriosis and also a total hysterectomy. And my mom, this lady right here, Kathy, she had a hysterectomy for a totally different reason. And in trying to prepare myself for this upcoming surgery, we've had a lot of discussions around, you know, what to expect and what happens after. And we've talked a lot about what, you know, Kathy actually went through and it brought up a lot. And mm -hmm. before you get started on your story, one thing I did find, because I know we both find this really interesting and I think other people will too, is we love looking up where words come from, mm. um, what's the meaning behind them, like where they came from. So I found this article in The Guardian, and um, it, it's an article that's called uh, the, Feminiz the Feminization of Madness is Crazy. Um, but it, it, within this article, it, it talks about where the word hysterical came from. So I just want to start with that little piece of information before we go into your story. So hysterical, it's a word with a very female baiting history coming from the Latin hystericus, which means of the womb. Um, this was a condition thought to be exclusive to women, sending them uncontrollably and neuro neurotically insane owing to a dysfunction of the uterus, the removal of which is still called a hysterectomy. So um, that little tiny nugget of information that you could go so much farther into finding out where that, like what the story is behind that, but that's just like a little glimpse of the term that's still used today <laughs> and, and i get it because it means of the womb but the um the origins the, yeah. and <clears throat> the meaning behind that word as it's associated to women and women's health and women's reproductive health and removing uh the womb and the uterus as a means of making us not hysterical um is interesting so I'm just gonna like leave that hanging <laughs> in the background. Leave it hanging in the background for you to consider. Well, I hope that there's some way you can actually uh, reference that article because it would be. Yes, I think I, I will include it in yeah. because it, it goes on. I mean, it's this is not really talking about. Um, it's not really talking about women's health per se, but it, it's an article about- Even just a you know. snippet, like that, that is, yeah. that's a powerful statement. And so um, what is a hysterectomy? A hysterectomy is an operation in which the uterus is removed. It is also called ablation of the uterus. Depending on the case, the cervix, the ovaries, and or fallopian tubes may also be removed. Why is the operation done? Hysterectomy is performed to relieve different pain or discomfort from illness or diseases. Hysterectomy has long been considered the first and only uh, solution for treating women, women with certain gynecological problems. However, today there are many other options available. Since hysterectomy is a major surgical and permanent procedure, it is important to ask questions that you may have and make sure you receive clear answers so that you can make the choice that meets your needs. So there are different types of hysterectomies, but it's this, this part, I actually got pretty, I'm, and I, I may get upset when I'm reading this. I actually can feel it as I'm doing it now. Um, it's so important that you ask questions so that you can make a choice that will actually meet your needs. And you can ask more than one doctor. 
what are the different types of hysterectomies? There are four types of hysterectomies. Uh, the hysterectomy performed depends on the problem. So there's a subtotal hysterectomy, which is a partial. It's removing the body of the uterus, but leaving the cervix in place. There's a total hysterectomy, which Raina, you might, will be having. It involves removing the body of the uterus as well as the cervix. A total hysterectomy, bilateral um, with, um, I can't say this word. I can't say the word. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to butcher it. Anyway, a bilateral of both ovaries are removed, involves removing of the body of the uterus, the cervix, as well as the ovaries and fallopian tubes. Then there's a radical hysterectomy. This is done specifically in the case of invasive gynecological cancer. It is the same procedure as a total hysterectomy, but also involves the removal of the upper part of the vagina, as well as the pelvic, lymphatic, and ganglions. And in May of 2017, I had already gone through, um, I, I'd been over a year that I hadn't had my period. So I was postmenopausal. Menopause just means the day that you're, you stop having your period. And they don't consider you in menopause until it's been a year. So you have to, I had to use a period tracker to be actually to be able to figure out when I was, just because if, when you have your last period, yeah. You don't really actually remember. So I knew that I was in menopause. I was on, I, I had gone through not sleeping. I didn't get a whole lot of hot flashes or anything. But anyway, um, I was on um, hormone replacement. I tried for two years, tried everything but going to my actual GP. Because I wanted to do it holistically. I wanted to do all these things. Nothing was helping. And so I finally you know what, can, can I stop you there just to ask yeah. you one question? Yes. I find this, this, this is an important place to, to say something. Because I think that it is so common for women to want to go the holistic route. And the reason I think that is, is because a lot of, because of the dismissal and, um, you know, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not able to think of the word right at the moment, but the being kind of brushed aside and, and dismissed in terms of our care. And honestly, the lack of knowledge and the lack of options that are presented to us when we come to them with issues involving our reproductive system. Mm -hmm. um, and so we go that holistic route because we've had those experiences Yes. And we just, it, we don't want to go through that trauma again. So we do, we go above and beyond. We yes. do everything we can. We do insane amounts of research. Um, and I, I think that's a I really do. important I... thing to, to say. Well, some of us do. Sorry, <laughs> I shouldn't say all of us. Some of us do. Or some of us don't and just feel really lost. Yeah, I just wanted relief. And I really, I, I was, I, to be honest, I was very nervous about, um, hormone replacement therapy. I just really, um, I just was really nervous about it. And, uh, but nothing was working. And even prior to that, I remember before I was technically in menopause, and just like you said, being dismissed, I am not a person who goes to the doctor readily, I very, very rarely go. Um, and I was really like, I'm like, uh, I, am I going through menopause? Is something happening? Because I'm like, the, these things are happening to my body. No, you're not in menopause, you still have your period, but it was never looked into like why I was going through anything. But anyway, finally, I went to my GP and I like after two years, and I was like, physically and emotionally, ready to snap because I was not sleeping. I was extremely irritable because of that. And then people look at you and it's like, oh yeah, she's so emotional. It's like, mm -hmm. holy crap, try not sleeping for two hysterical. years. Yeah, I was hysterical. Get rid of that. Anyway, so she, she said, you know what? This is what we're going to do. And I went on hormone replacement. Oh, she said, you know, you might find that you're going to start to sleep. And I did. <laughs> I slept and Dear Lord, there was nothing, I, like, honestly, I was so grateful for that. Well, then May 2017, which I think I had been on hormone replacement therapy for maybe a year, um, I started bleeding. And I, I, this is the first thing that went through my head. I'm like, are you kidding me? 
I can't wear white jeans. Like I was like, I'm, I'm in menopause now. I can wear white jeans. I don't have to worry about like accidents. And I, I, I actually wasn't afraid. And I'm like, I had, that's a whole I other should, thing. Yeah. But then I, there was a little tweak in my brain that went, okay, bleeding at my age is not normal. No. So I made an appointment. Now, in the, back, in the back of my mind, I was concerned that it might be cancer. Uh, but I really wasn't like terrified or anything. But I went in to see her. And so I had to have all these tests. I had to have like, you know, those wonderful ultrasounds. And um, hi, Emily. I had to have uh, an ultrasound. <clears throat> I had all sorts of things. And then I had to go and see a, gy a gynecologist in um, Sturgeon. Why can't I think of his name? He was a Dr. Unger, I think. He was very good. And he said, what are we going to do with you, Kath? You're an otherwise very healthy woman. He said, you know, he took um, um, a piece of the tissue. And then anyway, I had to go in and have another... Oh, I had to go in and actually have that tissue removed in October. So May, the bleeding started, and I, I randomly bled on and off throughout that time. I go in in October, and there's all these women in this room. And I remember sitting in the, in the uh, parking lot before we went in thinking, I wish I could just drop off my reproductive system. We've leave, talked about this so many times. I don't want, I don't want, I, like, leave who? my vagina in the waiting room. Bottom half yeah. of my body. Who anyway. wants, to, like, who picks this job? And I remember actually even asking the nurse what I was in there, because there's eight other women. Seven o'clock in the morning, lined up to get this, um, procedure. this procedure done. And um, she said, he's, he's the best. And she said, I know, I think, why would anybody do it? She said, but I'm really grateful he does. Yeah. So got it done. And he comes to see me after, and he says, you know what, Kath, he says, you're going to hear from us, but it's just going to, you're just going to be told everything's good. Don't worry about it. Everything looks good. We're fine. So I'm like, okay, cool. So this is around Thanksgiving and he didn't call. And I remember you who is like the hovering woman, mom, did you hear from the doctor yet? And I'm like, no, the hovering woman, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hovering, Thank checking you. in on me. And I'm like, did you hear from that? I'm like, no, no news is good news. And you're like, call. And I'm like, no, I'm not calling. I did not want to know. So the Thursday after Thanksgiving. Because you knew. Do you think you knew? I did not. I didn't. Yeah. The Thursday after Thanksgiving, um, I was headed to Winnipeg for a conference. And I'm at a friend's house. And I get the call. And I see that what the number is. And I'm like, hello. And they said, we need you to come in. And I'm like, oh, you do. You said that you were. I didn't have to come in. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> so anyway, and you were in Hawaii. I was yeah. having my own experience. Yeah. So anyway, long story short, I, I just shoved it down. What I always do, just shoved it down, didn't think yeah. about it, went to this conference, came back, went in. And I remember I was knitting. That was when I started knitting emotional scarves. Emotional scarves. Yes. Yeah. You need to bring those back. Except I and this scarf was red and I ironically it was red. I feel like it's symbolic, but I, it yeah. was probably 12 feet long like I was knitting like a crazy person and your dad came with me of course. and when we got to the um I said to him I want to go in by myself I don't want you to come in with me I was so nervous because I was thinking in my head at that moment my whole life is going to change he's going to tell me something and my whole life is going to change I'm not ready for that and so I went up to the front to the receptionist and I said could you tell me what kind of appointment is this do I have to take my pants off like <laughs> you think I might let you know I hate that this and she said she goes you know what I can't tell you that I, I don't know so I'm like okay and so I said to your dad you're not coming with me so he's like whatever you want he didn't agree with me but he goes whatever you want so the nurse came to get me for my appointment and we're at the door and I said what kind of appointment is this and she said do you have someone here with you and I'm like yes and she goes I think you should bring them with you so right then I'm like, yeah. okay, you don't, you don't need to tell me anything else. So I go get your dad, and I said, you can come with me. So I'm knitting ferociously, going, please don't come in, please don't come in. And he came in. The door opened. And he came in, and he leaned up against um, the examining table. I didn't have to take my pants off. I was just sitting there, and he oh. said, Kathy, you have cancer. 
that was it. And I said, thank you. Oh. And he said, it's a rare form. And as soon as you hear rare form, you're like, oh my gosh, it's the worst. Oh, it, and he said, but you know what, in that, it's, it's a really, um, the survival rate is amazing. It's very, it's very high. Um, the odd thing about it is it doesn't usually happen in women your age. It's usually younger, blah, blah, blah. It, it is kind of a blur of all the things that he said. Of course. He goes, you're going to have to have a radical hysterectomy. Uh, I could do the procedure, but the cross cancer is going to be taking you from here. Right. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions? And this is where I get emotional because I didn't ask any questions. I didn't have any questions. I didn't even know what to think. Listen, uh, you know what? At, at that moment in time, you think about the news you're receiving. And like, I think that it's almost insensitive to be like, okay, so do you have any questions? It's like, maybe a better alternative would be like, I know that this is this may come as a shock that you're probably going to need some time to process this. Can I give you the phone number here where you can get in contact with me or book an appointment, a phone appointment to ask me your questions when you've had a, a minute. So yeah, definitely he, don't be hard on yourself for that because I just, like, yeah, I like, honestly, I really didn't know what to ask. And even yeah. afterwards, I didn't know what to ask. Um, and then like this, this isn't a cancer story. I can tell everyone that I am completely healed of cancer. Um, I recovered beautifully. Um, but the journey to a hysterectomy and a radical hysterectomy at that was one of unknowing. Yes. I went through blindly and just did what I had to do. And yeah. to this, like it was today that I found out what, not today, but when I did the research, what a radical hysterectomy is and what it did to my body and the after effects uh, that I kept thinking, what's wrong with me? What's going and on? Having to and fight, there's no having aftercare. To no, and having to fight uh, because what happened was after my radical hysterectomy, which included not only, like I knew I was getting my ovaries removed. I knew I was getting my fallopian tubes removed. I knew I was getting my root and my uterus. I didn't know that I, I didn't know I got my cervix removed and I didn't, know, which may seem silly, but I did no. not know that the upper part of my uterus and my vagina was removed. No. I didn't know that. And I, like, I remember sitting like actually, and I will get upset. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what does that even mean? And you go through and you think, like, what are the risks? But what afterwards? Yeah. Like, what about hormone replacement? What about my sexuality? All yeah. the feelings. Like, there's so many things. And I'm not here to scare anyone. I'm here to say no. that if I could give anyone any advice, it's to, like, if you don't know what to ask, lean on somebody that you know maybe have gone, has gone through it. Well, um, I think it's important to say that, like, this stuff for women is still so taboo to talk about. Oh, my and goodness, yes. as women, you know, we are just wired to support one another and connect with each other and help each other out and share our experiences yeah. and, you know, um, help each other through these experiences and in the, the medical system, it doesn't always feel safe to uh, talk about these things or to ask these questions. And a lot of times it's totally downplayed. Like hysterectomies to the medical community or the medical doctors you see um, or whoever you're dealing with is like, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. It's, yeah. not, it's, not, it's not that big a deal. And it's like, no, and actually... You know it, it actually is a big deal. System. I was um, quite lucky because I got, I could talk to my sister. My sister had had the same surgery that you're going to have uh, without the ablation. So uh, her ovaries excision. were left. Um, and, and basically she said, like, she goes, I don't, I don't even know if I have my cervix. Like little things like you don't know, but she told me about afterwards because she said, Kath, you're going to feel good shortly after. I, okay, 
Let's talk about the medical procedure. I had a robotic lap laparoscopic uh, surgery. And I remember the doctor telling me beforehand, she said, and it was at the Lois Whole Woman's Hospital. And I was taken very good care of. Um, I was only in there for actually 12 hours and then sent home. Um, but anyway, uh, she said, there's two things that could happen. Depending on what we find, you could have the laparoscopic robot do the surgery or, um, or the robot do the laparoscopic surgery, or you could get a full on opening up of uh, like a full incision and different kind of surgery. So I remember when I woke up going, what did I get? And they said laparoscopic and I'm like, yes. and I, so I knew I'm like, okay, okay, that's fine. But I didn't know what they did. So afterwards you get home and this is what I was saying to Raina. I'm like, you know, I, I left eight hours after I wanted to get out of the hospital. I wasn't staying there. I had a 20 minute drive home. It was the most horrible 20 minutes of my life. I wasn't like I was, I didn't, I didn't even, I felt horrible. I got in the house. I was ex physically exhausted. I got into the house and my, your, your sister, Joe was there taking care of Wendell. She met us at the door and I stood and I held on to the handle of like the stairway. And I was, she said, you were green, mom. You were so pale. And I said, I just started to cry. And they were like, okay. And then the pain had gotten so, um, I, I had pain. And your dad's like, I'm going, like he didn't go to the pharmacy. He just wanted to get me home. And then he went and got me my drugs. And then within that, I was asleep. And by Friday morning, I felt pretty normal. Um, and that's the scary part. You have to really listen to your body. Uh, because when you're sitting alone, healing, you see things that, oh, well, there's a dust bunny there. Well, you can't vacuum. <laughs> you have small children. You can't pick them up. You need to have care. And I mean, I didn't have small children. I just had a big dog. And I just, they're going to give you information that is good information about your aftercare and just listen to them. Whether or not you're patient, that doesn't matter. You will have had, if you are going to have a hysterectomy, whatever level it is, it is major surgery and you need to listen to, you're welcome, uh, Emily. You need to listen to your physicians and oh, like really listen to your body yeah. because yeah. you're going to. And again, it, it goes back to that whole thing we've been talking to, uh, talking about a lot is feeling the need to always be productive or hustling yeah. or doing all the things and bouncing back after and just like pushing through and, and, and being productive. And it's like, no, like it's a major surgery and you need to heal. Um, and yeah. And Jen, yeah, Jen actually, you need to she just, just went through uh, surgery herself and she's been, she's been incredible. We've been chatting online. Um, she's been sharing her experiences with me and um, yeah, and you know, this, this really is a super emotionally charged conversation and there is so much to say. There's so much that I really want oh my to goodness. touch on. Touch on I'm sorry, well. I probably took up too no, much time and, and we didn't even to me. Well, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna hit the stop button on that apology because your story is so important. And like I said, at the beginning of this episode, we're not going to have time to cover everything that we need to cover because it's there is a lot to cover and your story is so important and so meaningful and i know that this like the small part that you shared with us is really going to be helpful to other women um because the thing the thing is in my experiences, going through everything I've gone through with gynecologists, OBGYNs, whatever you want to call them, GPs, um, all sorts of different specialists, is, you know, I do my research. And in the beginning, I didn't. And I learned the hard way through consequences of me just trusting blindly um, and, and not doing my research, I had to pay those consequences physically, emotionally, mentally. Um, and there's no accountability to anyone else. No one, no, no one gets held accountable. 
I have to suffer those consequences. So, you know, it's probably a coping mechanism and a trauma response for me to over research what I'm doing, but I do that now. And when I go in and I talk to doctors, there is a, a big issue because um, as someone living with chronic pain and chronic illness, especially to do with the female re reproductive system and um, all the misinformation there is surrounding that, um, a lot of times I'm scoffed at or there is offense taken yes. to me speaking up and advocating for myself and saying, actually, my research has, sh has let me know that this isn't actually accurate anymore. This is the case. And I can't tell you the number of times I've had to sit and basically feel like I'm a, a child being scolded for speaking out of turn and that I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. And I don't know how many times also I've been told because I, the online communities of people um, dealing with chronic illness, chronic pain, um, reproductive issues, infertility, all the different things that go along with what we're talking about. And, and I'm talking assigned female at birth. This includes the trans community, mm -hmm. um, non-binary LGBTQ community as well, yes. um, which is a whole other topic I want to cover at another time. Um, but, you know, those communities online have literally saved me, have empowered me, excuse me, yeah. to be able to advocate for myself and to ask questions and find answers. And I go into these doctor's offices and they say, God, those groups on Facebook, those women on Facebook, they just spread misinformation and they, they, make, they make you, you ask all these questions. Yeah. And, and it's like, and I, are you actually kidding me right now? And, and that's, that's what the response is. And, you know, I, I am not in any way, please believe me when I say, I'm not trying to sit here and say that doctors are evil yeah. and that doctors don't care. Uh, please don't take that to be what I'm trying to say because that's not it. Um, yeah. But there are very specific issues that we face going in to the medical system to try to navigate and get the care we need um, mm -hmm. and be heard and taken seriously. Um, and it's, there's so many things that need to change within that realm. Um, and again, like I said, there's, there's gonna have to be other episodes on this. Um, <laughs> I did really, really want to share some things. I don't know if we have, have time for me to share them um what how are we looking for time there we're at 16 minutes 16 minutes okay well so um one of the things that i i'm not going to go into to all the different statistics and things that we were going to talk about about how another layer to this is adding on you know, um, the BIPOC community. Yes, I really us. wanted us to talk about that. Yeah, and we will. We will talk about the how, you know, the inequality kind of goes up a notch. Um, if you're a person of color, indigenous, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it goes up dramatically. And that's really important to note. And, and again, we can't cover everything in this one episode, but um, I wanted to mention it. But one, one thing I, I will say, and, and I'm actually buying this book today, and it's, it's been on my list. I'm probably going to get it on Audible as well, if it's available. Um, there's a book called Pain uh, and Prejudice, yeah. and it's How the Medical on. System so Ignores Women. Um, and it's by Gabrielle Jackson, and she did a segment on The Social, which is a Canadian... It. Uh, talk show and I shared it in my on my personal Instagram page again today um, and I'll link and share it. it here too yeah we'll share it here too for sure um, but that book um, is like a more in-depth look um, at exactly what we're talking about and she specifically has endometriosis and and I think 
you know, a lot of the information um, is, is within that book about that particular area, but it covers everything mm -hmm. to do with um, how women are ignored in the medical system. Um, and, you know, for me personally, listening to your story and talking to you yes. um, about what I'm about to go through um, is, has been so helpful. And like I said, the online communities have been my safe place and my place where I have actually found the most factual, I don't know if that's even the right word, but like the, the oh, most correct, current information on what I'm dealing with. Well, um, can I just interrupt? Because remember when you went to actually find out information about your surgery and you found inconsistencies and things that were incorrect on the website? Yeah, I thank you for reminding me about that because I actually really, really did want to talk about that. Um, so for my surgery, I actually have it right in front of me. Um, the letter that I received and the information I was told, um, it says you are scheduled for the following procedure, total laparoscopic hysterectomy, bilateral salpingectomy, excision of endometriosis, cystoscopy. And so that's the the laundry list of, of my procedures. And I was told, please visit myhealth.alberta.ca for information regarding your procedure. Um, I went to the site. First of all, excision isn't listed. It's under laparoscopy. And the word excision is not found within the information there. Um, and it's very outdated. I looked up endometriosis on this um, AHS site and the definition was wrong. And people, I have had responses from um, different people in my life. They're like, what? like, it's not really that big a deal. It is a big deal mm -hmm. because the definition of endometriosis um, is literally the foundation upon which um, the person who sent you the definition, if it's incorrect, that's the foundation, foundation on which they are basing their knowledge of how to treat you and the mm -hmm. care they give you. So if they have the wrong definition, they're not going to be giving you the right treatment. And yeah. that is so important and it does matter and it's worth making noise about. So being who I am, I sat down. It took me a couple days to sat down because honestly, I just didn't have the capacity and it truly is overwhelming. I sat down and I wrote an email. And unfortunately, in writing that email, I went further into the website um, where you can click on different links. Once you go inside the definition of endometriosis and it tells you about treatments and there was so much misinformation saying that, you know, pregnancy and hysterectomies can completely you know take away your mm -hmm. symptoms and you don't have to worry about it anymore to um after menopause there's you don't have to worry about it anymore um to just tons of misinformation i was literally twitching as i was reading through this information and getting so oh, fired up of course like it's so frustrating and so I sent this email and it was quite lengthy. I took screenshots of everything and provided and cited my resources from the most um, respected and um, most current correct information where I get it from. Mm -hmm. And I, I got a response quite quickly actually. And it was literally just like, you know, thank you for your concern. Um, we need you to know that we have the most um, What's the word I'm looking for? The, like uh, the most capable Comprehensive. Um, uh, gynecologists who specialize in endometriosis in the province, giving us our information for this website. So, you know, thanks. And to be clear, I do understand that response because I am a patient. I'm not a medical professional. I don't have a medical degree. I don't, I am not... I don't have the credentials to back the information that I'm giving. Um, I'm just a person who is affected by the disease and ha I've been living with it for, for 20 years, you know, like, so um, 
so I went on the website and I have since seen that they changed, you know, kind of one word within the definition. That's an important word. Um, they were saying that endometriosis is the lining of the uterus that grows outside of the uterus. And that is the incorrect definition. It is not the lining of the uterus. It is similar to the lining of the uterus. And I know that that sounds so nitpicky, but it's so important because they're not the same thing mm -hmm. at all. Totally. And, and it is not just, um, it's not just a disease of the reproductive system. It's not only in the pelvic region. It can, it has been found on every single organ of the body. It's a full body disease. And it is so important because a lot of the majority of doctors in Alberta say that hormonal treatments and therapies um, are an effective treatment for endometriosis. And that information has been proven to be false. So I'm not going to get too much into all, like I know I've probably said too much, but um, you know, I sent that email, I got that response, a little change was made and I definitely have to celebrate that. Um, and I'm not going to stop. No. You know, I've also recently connected with an organization um, in Alberta that works directly with Lois Hole out of the Royal Alex. It's research based and it's called yes. the AWHF, which is the Alberta Women's Health Foundation. And I went to their website and I, I looked and I noticed that endometriosis was nowhere to be found in the, the research that they are doing to improve women's care. They're doing so much great work, um, but I connected with them over that and I'm hoping something will come of that. Mm -hmm. But there are foundations and places that are trying to improve women's care. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times the advocacy and the people that have to make noise are the ones who are suffering, are the ones that um, have experienced the the issues firsthand. Um, but it's important work and it's work we need to do in order to make change. Um, and so that we can see, you know, our daughters and, and the next generation and not have to go through what we've gone through, right? Yes, and thank you for for that. And it, like like you said, um, like we really we have about seven minutes left. Um, like you said, this is a huge topic, and we touched on. Uh, I mean, there were things that I want to talk about, like the like what happens to your body after a hysterectomy, um, and just what happens to you emotionally. And I just remember, and hear hear me out. We're gonna probably end on this. I remember, I was a woman who went through menopause. I wasn't going to have any more babies. My reproductive system was really on the, it was, it was fading out. Like, like I mean, everything was, I, I'm aging. But, you know, I went through a grieving process. I remember not feeling feminine. I remember feeling like my body had betrayed me. I remember mm -hmm. thinking, like, I, I looked at your father. We were driving in the car, and I got emotional, and I said, I don't feel like a woman. Right. And he's like, Kath, you are, like, but he didn't understand. He didn't know even how to respond. He didn't have to have a response. I felt that way. And I felt incomplete. I felt such sadness. And then I actually, I, I, I even had someone say to me that I was too masculine shortly after that. It was, I had yeah. been singing somewhere and I was like, oh my gosh, this was a gut punch. You just reinforced the fact that I don't feel like a woman and now you're telling me I'm too masculine, which like, what? But I just want you to know if you are going through a health issue, whether or not it is of your reproductive system or there's something not right in your body, that your voice matters. And our doctors, there are doctors that are amazing. I've had amazing, amazing doctors in my life who have listened to me and have taken action, who have brushed me off and said, go back, like leave. Um, but it's, and I was of the person who didn't ask a lot of questions. And I guess the bottom line is you have the right 
and the responsibility to yourself to ask the questions. And yes. if you don't feel like you're getting the right information, you can seek other counsel. That's okay. And, you know, menopause doesn't just happen to women who are 54. There are induced types of menopause. And that is like if you have your ovaries removed, um, if you've gone through chemotherapy, menopause. right? Um, uh, radiation treatment, uh, ovarian uh, malfunction. There are young women who are going through menopause. And uh, I just want to end. There is a menopause clinic in Ed in Edmonton at the Grey Nuns Hospital that thank God I got to go to because I got to go through menopause twice. After my surgery, I went through it again. You're an expert. In like on a, on a next level, not sleeping, having the sw night sweats, the whole thing. And I literally felt like I, I didn't want to be here anymore. I was so tired. And well, my it, doctor, it went on for a really long time. Dude, I, I, two years. Two years. I kept going in, and my doctor's like, we can't put you on hormone can you therapy. Can you share one of the things your doctor suggested to you? Oh, um, boggles my mind. this was right after my surgery. I said, I'm like afraid. Like, what if I can't? Like, I can't sleep. I've had the surgery, and I can't sleep. And she said, just have a vodka. I'm like, what? What? Wait, what? Yeah. Um, and it was like, just, you, you know what? You're lucky to be here. Like, you are lucky to be. And yeah, I was lucky to be here. And they wouldn't put me on hormone replacement because I had cancer. And I remember going to my doctor <sighs> saying, I don't even care. Like, they were afraid that I was going, like, I, my risks were high. And I'm like, you took everything out. I'm cancer free. And I went to the, um, the, the menopause clinic and my doctor, who was going on stress leave after me, I guess, was I was her last patient. She goes... <laughs> Let me look into this because your case Thanks, is not. Gosh. She goes, yeah. your case isn't normal, and I want to check into this. And I know your um, your doctor, your surgeon, uh, your oncologist. So she's like, I know her. I'm going to talk to her. So she got off the phone, and I'm sitting there. And I knew when I went to the clinic, I'm like, I'm not going to get anything. She came back, and she goes, You got it. Yeah. She goes, We're putting you on such a low dose, and. This is going to be fine, but it's finding someone who's going to listen to you even after two years because I was done. Well, and see, that's the thing. That's the thing that is, is again, we're going to have to do another two episode. Minutes. Yeah, we're going to have to do another episode, but I think it's really important to state that, and this directly affects me too, and people within the chronic illness community is, you know, your quality of life mm -hmm. matters. And it is so fucked up, pardon my language, but it is so fucked up that we are made to think that it doesn't. To be like, yeah. the, the fact that you had to go two years, basically, you know, sleep deprivation is a Baby. form of torture. Just take, just take pills, just take sleeping pills, just do right. this. Just like... dr drink alcohol. Like, are you kidding me? Like a medical professional, really? So... So, you know, we have less than two minutes left, but I just really want to reiterate that because I have struggled with fighting for my right to have even just a baseline quality of life. And it shouldn't be that way. No. And this is an important conversation. And we really want you guys to weigh in on this, share this live if you can, once we put it to our IGTV, get people to the podcast. Your, your female friends, um, people with with female reproductive systems, um, please tag them in this yep. um, and comment and tell us your experiences. We want to hear them. Um, thank you for listening to yes. us. And I can say that at that the menopause clinic, I was surrounded by women who were in who are in their thirties and in their seventies, and my heart broke for each one of them. And we love you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, to be continued. Be, yeah, this will be on our podcast. You can listen to it or you can watch us. All right. Thank you. Have a good day, you guys. Bye-bye.